Every year I tell Bonnie, I say, here are all the places that have invited us to come and teach. And I'm getting old and it's harder and harder, you know, to travel. I said, where should we go? And you know the first place she picks? It's here. She really does. That's Bonnie's first choice. And uh, what we found is there are some places Word of Life has that are so remote, I usually get sick when I go there. I mean, I got E. coli, uh, horrible. I mean, I had to go in the hospital in Thailand. Uh, it was terrible. And, uh, and so, you know, the older you get, you know that uh, you can't go everywhere. And so we're just thankful that we're still healthy enough to come here and eat that kimchi and completely revamp our internal organs by that spice. Okay, here we are. So what I'm saying is it's a blessing to be here. Uh, welcome to class 15. And what we're going to do is uh, I decided that I would finish the book of Isaiah in 14 classes and then apply it for one whole class. This is the application of the whole book of Isaiah. We, and what I'm going to pray about in just a moment is Isaiah said he wants us to learn how to live in perfect peace in our crumbling world. And the way we do that, he lists off by trusting the Bible, seeing our culture has gone totally astray, presenting our life back to the Lord by consecration, seeing that Christ, it, I mean, it's him we want to reflect. He fulfills all the promises. We know what's coming. We know the adversary that's trying to trick us, Satan. We want to stand for justice in a world with national sins. We learn the power and the assurance of prayer. Then we start applying this inspired book to our life. We, we believe the character of God that is so awesome that can solve all of our fears. We know God's in control. We understand and experience his salvation, which leads us to having the compassion of Christ. We know how it's going to end. He's going to return and rule and restore. So here's where we are today. How do you apply the book of Isaiah? I, I think the simplest way to put it is the, the greatest thing in all of life. There's a chorus about that. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you, loving you, serving you. It's usefulness to God. He wants us to love him. He wants us to know him. He wants us to serve him. But the only way that works is learning to listen to God every day in his word. We never get far enough along in our life that we don't need a daily bread. Man, Jesus said this, man, that's humans, each of us, shall not live by rice alone or bread, but by what? Every word of God. Remember, I started out the class in Proverbs saying, how many of you have read the whole Bible? How long does it take to read the whole Bible? Hours. If you're in sixth grade and are reading it out loud. If you just listen to it in a, on your digital device, download it as, as audio files. It takes 60, I mean 72 hours to get all 66 books. Why would that be important? Because we need to learn to listen to the voice of God in his word every day. So let's pray. Father, we want to obey what Jesus said. And I pray this hour you would help every one of these precious students to come to the point where they say, I can't live any day without your word. It's not just I need to eat food every day. I need to hear your voice every day. Teach us that so we can be useful to you. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. What is it like to hear God's voice every day? Some photographer did this. Probably it was Stone. It looks like one of his pictures. This is a beautiful uh, open shutter you know, exposure of the Milky Way galaxy. See how you can see the, the beautiful array of stars? And it's up on some great vantage point, and you can see all the lights in the city and everything else. But that just is a picture to me of the heavens of our God that is our creator. And God offers us every day through his word to look past his creation and to look at him as the creator. And so I'd like to talk about how we do that. Let's start by kind of laying the foundation. What happened when you and I got saved? 
okay? What, what is, what, how does God look at where we were before we were saved? So look at this Christmas passage. It's, it's almost, you know, Christmas is coming. Thanksgiving's almost here. This is why Jesus came in the world. Luke chapter 1. And let me get there with you. Do you remember Luke? Luke was writing down a record of Paul's life and the gospel for his trial, most likely. And so Luke starts back with his interviews of Mary and all of the early uh, involved with the birth of Christ people. And this is what he records, starting in verse 76. And you, child, what are we? This, who's talking here? Zacharias, John the Baptist's dad, the, the priest Zacharias. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. That's John the Baptist. For you will be called, go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. That's Isaiah 40. So see how tied it is? All of the books of the Bible are tied together. Uh, and this is Luke recording uh, the, the prayer of Zacharias, who's quoting Isaiah. Uh, to prepare the way of the Lord, verse 77, to give knowledge of salvation to his people. What, what is salvation? By the remission of their sins. How does God remit our sins? Through the tender mercies of our God. How did he do it? Verse 78, with which the day spring from on high has visited us. Remember I told you the first time I read through the whole Bible, I marked Every name, title, and description, I mark that. Did you know that God calls Jesus the day spring from on high? That's who Jesus is. That's one of his titles. That's one of his descriptors. Jesus is, what is day spring? That means sunrise. It's the beginning of the day when we go from darkness to light. And the day springs into the darkness. That's how God describes sending Christ. That's what Christmas is. That's what the birth of Christ was. It was us sinners in the darkness getting light on us. But, but listen what he continues to say. With which, verse 78, the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Jesus came to bring the dawning of a new day to the world, to every single individual human. Do you see why I got to speak at the rescue mission? I could look at all those men and women that were alcoholics and substance abusers and drug addicts and homeless and say, Jesus has come to give you the dawning of a new day. You can be a new creation in Christ today. Or if you already know him, you can come back to him. I was a youth pastor for many years, a, a youth pastor. Do you see, do you notice I never stand still? How many of you have noticed I never stand still? Do you know why? I learned that so many years ago as a youth pastor. I learned that if you're continually moving, there's something about young people, they, they're attracted to motion. That's why all the, you know, if you watch kids watching cartoons, it's, it's motion, it's games. They're just, there's something about us we like to watch movement. So I would walk around with my, my youth group and, and tell them that Jesus Christ offers them this. And this is my illustration. I'd say, if that's Jesus and, and you are a sinner and you come to Jesus, no matter how many steps away from him after you get saved that you take, you know, they... they fall into sin, they feel guilty, they feel hopeless, they stop reading their Bible, they stop praying, they stop going to church, they start going back to their old ways. All those are steps away from the Lord. No matter how many steps I've taken away from the Lord, it's always just one step back to as close to him as possible. Did you know that's what Christianity is? What's that one step? It's the word that's repeated Countless times through the New Testament. Repent. No matter how far you got away from the Lord, say, I don't, 
you're like the prodigal son feeding the pigs. He finally, it says, he came to himself. That's repentance. You come to yourself and you say, I don't want this. I hate sin. I hate where I've gotten. Lord, forgive me. Now, what does he ask? Are we supposed to get on our knees and crawl back to him and take months and beat ourselves up? No. He said, no matter how many steps you take away from me, it's just one step back. Do you see why the gospel is so great? Jesus is the dawning of a new day for anyone, anywhere. At the closing of class a few days ago, I told you about my hero, C.T. Studd, you know, the guy that went to the cannibals and everything. I collect missionary biographies of these people whose lives are done for the Lord, and they've written down what the Lord did through them, and I try and sift out and look at what it was God used in their life. For C.T. Studd, he told those cannibal, demon-indwelt, murderous, wicked pygmies <clears throat> that Jesus came to be the dawning of a new day. But did you catch? Look at, look at the end. It says, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Do you, do you see the Bible, how, how vivid it is? God says all of us are blind sinners. We're all dead in our trespasses and sin, which means we're spiritually blind. We can't see him. And we're sitting, if this is the edge of a cliff and this is a great precipice down, we're all sitting and our legs are dangling. We're right here on the edge of the cliff. We're sitting in the dark and we don't know whether there's grass right between our feet or hell, you know, an endless bottomless pit. And we're just sitting there dangling our feet and we're sitting in the darkness and we're blind and we can't tell how far down it is. And in that moment, to give light, the day spring from on high. Salvation is when God reaches blind sinners sitting in the dark on the edge of an eternal void headed toward destruction, and God shines the light on them. How did Jesus describe salvation to Paul? Here's the second verse. Did you know this is Paul's testimony of how Jesus led him? Paul is before the, the Roman leaders and the Jewish leaders, and they've invited Paul to give his testimony. Now, I tell everybody you ought to have three testimonies. You ought to have like the 15, 30-second one you can do in an elevator. You know, when someone says, what's up with you? You say, boy, I'm a, a guilty convict that Jesus Christ has forgiven all my sins, and, and I trusted him. You know, that's... 10 seconds, maybe you could add a few seconds. Or you need the one I gave to Daniel when he was sliding the coffee across, you know. You're going to wake up in hell someday if you don't have something done with your sins. Then you need the kind of one or two minute, three minute one where you give the details, how you heard about Christ and how you were a sinner and how you trusted him. Then you have the long one. You know, I mean the one that tells all the details. Paul got the opportunity to give his middle, not the long one, and not the shorty, he gave the middle one, right here. What does he say? Look at Acts 26, 18. He's, uh, before all these pomp and, and uh, military leaders and everybody else, he's there, and King Agrippa, and uh, he starts, I mean, chapter 26, he's saying, I'm happy to share this, and he starts. And then he says in, in verse 18, now, if you notice, Jesus starts talking in verse 15. So just for you to see the context. So I said, this is Paul, who are you, Lord? Verse 15. And he, that's Jesus, said, I am Jesus. So if you have a red letter Bible, the words of Christ have started. So this is Jesus explaining how he led Paul to salvation. This is really a great passage. This 18th verse is really, really important. He said, rise, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you for this purpose. Here's why I knocked you off your horse, Paul, on your way to Damascus. To make you a minister and a witness of the things which you have seen and of things which I will yet reveal to you. That's him going out in the backside of the desert we talked about in chapel. I will deliver you from the Jewish people. They hounded him, his whole ministry. As well as from the Gentiles to whom now I send, I send you. Okay, what, what is Paul's gospel message. What happened to him and what is he supposed to present happens to other people. This is Jesus explaining what he wants to happen to people to get saved. Verse 18, to open their eyes. 
in order to turn them from darkness to light. Remember, we're sitting on the edge of the cliff in the dark, blind. He wants to open our eyes. He turns us from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to God, we get liberated. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. Wow, that's the greatest miracle he's still doing. And an inheritance. Wow, we have a reservation in heaven. Among those who are sanctified. So basically, this is what salvation is. Our eyes are opened, spiritually, so that we can see that we're in the dark and see the light, and now we want it. Remember John 1 says that we formerly loved the darkness, now we love the light and are drawn to it. We're liberated from the power of Satan. See, I was born into Satan's family. I was born hateful, selfish, murderous. Murderous? Have you ever seen a baby get mad? Their face turns red. They kick. They, they would murder you if they could. They get so mad. I know, I've raised a lot of children. I mean, they just... You can hear them in stores. I don't think in Korea they do it. But in America, the kids will just throw themselves on the floor and kick and scream. They would do anything. They get so angry. They were born a child of the devil. You know, people don't like that. People think children are sweet, innocent. They're not sweet, and they're not innocent. They're infected with the S-I-N virus from conception. And they live life sinners. I'm glad I didn't say that. That's not popular. That's what God says, okay? How do we get out of that? It's supernatural. It's we, the Lord, saves us from the power of Satan to God. He forgives all of our sins. He instantly gives us endless life. That's our inheritance. We're partakers. Hebrews 7 and verse 16 says, we live after the power of an endless life. How did Hudson Taylor go to China and live with the Chinese? How did uh, Goforth, Jonathan Goforth, go here to Korea He's kind of the granddaddy of all this Presbyterianism that's in Korea. How did uh, you know, C.T. Studd go to Africa and do what he did and live among those people? They received the inheritance. We have endless life. We know we are the temple of God. And what does God want to do with us? He wants to sanctify us. How does all of salvation and sanctification occur? By faith in Christ. Remember the very first class I told you the whole Bible is about God, what God wants. What does God want right now? Well, Isaiah is about God wanting us to learn how to focus every day on him. So let's do that. Let's go to Isaiah 33. The whole 33rd chapter of Isaiah is an amazing um, going back and forth between how God wants uh, the people of Israel to live today and the future. And, and it's this looking to heaven and looking to the millennium and then going back to Jerusalem. And so it's just an amazing chapter. Uh, but I ask you before we go into this, how is your focus on the Lord these days? How are you doing, I don't mean on your homework and your papers and your assignments and all your classes, but just you. How clearly... Are you seeing the Lord in his word? How clearly do you see the reflection of Christ? The book of James says that the Bible is like a mirror. Did any of you look in the mirror today? I won't ask. All of us should have, you know. Uh, to see, because uh, I've been accused many times of going into work with shaving cream right here. And right here, because if you shave, in the, if a man shaves in the morning, he goes, and then he goes like this. And if you're not looking in a mirror, you don't realize that in all this shaving stuff, it went wider than your face. And so I, I can remember times when, when I was actually in college, and it was, I just shaved and there was no mirror, that the guys would go, you have shaving cream, white, looks like whipping cream. Do you intend to have whipping cream on your ears? I go, no. You know what they knew I hadn't done? Looked in a mirror. 
Okay? If you look in the mirror, you wouldn't do that. What does the Bible say the Bible is? It's a mirror. And we hold up this book, and what's really interesting is, in the mirror, we see ourself, but right behind us is who we're trying to look like, Jesus Christ. And what we compare in the Bible is what I look like, what I'm supposed to look like, Christ. And I go, whoa, now I see everything that needs to change. Because my goal is Christ's likeness. How are you doing at that? That's, that's, what I just described is your daily devotions. Daily devotions is not finishing a quiet time. It's not checking off a box. It's not what I have done with you this whole class. This is my Isaiah and Proverbs devotional journal I've done with you. I started in October. I got a head start from you. It's not the mechanics of doing that. It's the goal of learning how to focus on God every day. Now, I've told you in, in class, past classes that Jesus summarized the only thing Jesus said that all of us are supposed to follow as our pattern is his prayer. He said in Matthew 6, verses 9 onward, he said, after this manner, pray ye. It's actually a command. It isn't a command that the Roman Catholic Church took up to have everybody repeat it in the service. Did you know they do that? Do you know why they do it? Because Jesus said, do it. But they just had people quote the Lord's Prayer. It's the most, by the way, the Lord's Prayer is the most well-known portion of Scripture in the whole world. At least two and a half billion people know it. That's more than a third, well, it's just under a third of everybody, knows it by heart, the Lord's Prayer. The goal is not to quote it. The goal is to do it. Do you remember Jesus goes through? Do you remember how it starts? It starts by this. The very first thing he said is, you know, the, our Father who art in heaven. That's the first letter of each word. Hallowed be thy name. What is that? That is, Lord, focus me on you. It, and and I, I not only taught you that, I, I taught it again in, in Isaiah 6, where I said we need to look up at the Lord high and lift it up. Do you remember I talked about the burning ones, the seraphim? And, and then we went to Revelation 4 and I talked about the cherubim as they're floating around. Then I talked about all those angels, hundreds of millions of them standing and falling before the Lord. What is all that for? Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer that the most important thing for life you need to do in the Lord's Prayer that all of us are supposed to follow this pattern is, number one, start every day, start every prayer with everything else stops and you focus on God. And once you focus on God, once you pause your life and, and say, Father, you're my, the perfect Father, you're my Father, you are in heaven you're seated on the throne. I want to hallow, I want to magnify, I want to worship you. Then we start asking for things. And the first thing Jesus said is, thy kingdom come, which means I want you to control me. Thy, is it very interesting? Thy kingdom come, I want you to control me. Thy will be done. I want you to lead me. I want to do your will, not my own, so you have to show me what it is. Everything about the Lord's Prayer, and we already studied that, is learning how every day to focus on God. So how do we do that? Well, look at Isaiah 33, and we'll start in verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. What's he talking about? Well, the context is, we already know, the Assyrians are coming, Hezekiah is rattled. They're building walls. We already covered that back in, you know, in the chapters 36 to 39. The Assyrians are starting to camp outside the city. We know they're going to besiege us. We know that they're going to 
skin us alive, probably, like they did everywhere else. So the, the sinners in Jerusalem are afraid. Fearfulness has seized on the hypocrites. Isaiah says, wow, this is what you need to do. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Have any of you read the book of Hebrews? What did the writer of Hebrews describe God as? Remember my very first reading through the Bible? I marked every name of God. What's, what does the book of Hebrews describe God as? Our God is a consuming fire. That's chapter 12. You ever notice that? God, one of the descriptions of God, one of the, the titles and descriptions and the way he describes and reveals himself to us in the book of Hebrews is exactly right here in Isaiah 33, 14 to 17. And when we, when Jesus told us every day you need to reorient your life toward God, you start by focusing on who he is. Who is he? Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? Do you know what fire and God have in common? Fire purifies. It consumes. And what's left when it's done is what, what endures. You know, that's, they, they refine silver. They refine gold. They refine platinum. They refine all these things. So God, God, who is holy and infinite and eternal and just and holy, he describes himself as a devouring fire, as the everlasting burnings. Verse 15, here's the answer. He who walks righteously, who speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppression, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, saying no, who stops his ears from hearing a bloodshed, who shuts his eyes from seeing evil. What's the benefit, verse 16? He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be in the fortress of rocks. Who's hearing this? The people of Jerusalem that are surrounded by all these this is chapter 33. Chapter 36, the Assyrians are coming. These are the people that are facing. They're somewhere between Lachish being destroyed by the Assyrians and Sennacherib surrounding them. They're right there. And you know what the Lord's saying to them? This is what I offer you. The place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. Water will be sure. What were the two things that were sure during the siege of a city? you would not have bread and water because they encircled the city, cut off everything, and starved you out till you surrendered. God says, hey, no matter how many armies come around you, I will be a defense, I will be a fortress. But here's the goal. This is the best part right here. Verse 17. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty, and you will see the land that is very far off. Wow. That's the Lord's Prayer. That's why I put up there Matthew 6, 9. If we learn what the Lord is offering by listening to his voice every day in his word, what it does is it transports us from being inside a besieged city with enemies surrounding us with a hopeless situation coming. And we're transported out of that. Look at verse 17. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. Uh, my training, when I was in uh, seminary, do you know what I studied? I wanted to, my doctorate, all my doctoral work is in church history. That's my, my love is church history. And, and my dissertation was, the topic was uh, medieval Christology, no, a Christology of medieval hymns and revealing what people believed about Christ through hymns. How do you like that for a topic? That was my topic for my doctorate, my PhD at Bob Jones University. Uh, what an amazing study it was. But you know what I did for that? I studied people's confessions of faith, especially martyrs. There are many recorded martyrs, people that died because they were witnessing for Christ. Most of them died 
sharing the gospel in a, such a way that they had to stop them. They were so compelling. Here they are, tied to a post with burning sticks around them, and they're looking out at the people and they're saying, Jesus saved me from all my sins. I have hope. I can see the king and his beauty and the land that is very far off. I'm headed there right now. You can see the fire is coming up here. I'm going there now, but are you? Did you know your sins are forgiven? Did you know during the Inquisition, you know what the Inquisition is. It's the Roman Catholic extermination of born-again Christians that were reading the Bible and trying to evangelize people. During that time, they developed a pair of tongs that had um, cutters on the front, like you'd trim a tree with, only the tongs went like this. And they would go up and cut the tongue out of the people they were executing because they wanted them to stop sharing the gospel. I mean, we're already in territory that it's hard to even think about. I mean, I can't imagine being burned to death. I, I burned my finger on the stove and it hurt for a week. Can you imagine burning every inch of your body and how painful that would be and how, how long and everything? Do you know what I learned in my dissertation and work on the, the confessions of these martyrs? Well, I'll tell you one. They cut his tongue off. His brother was next to be burned at the stake. This martyr told his brother that even though they tied him with chains, he said, if you notice, they don't pile the wood up high enough, my hands will be showing. So I'm not going to be able to talk. And it'll be smoky, because smoke rises. He said, you probably won't be able to see my eyes. He said, watch my hands. And he said, I'll give you a signal. Because the brother was scared. They told him if they would deny Christ, they would just stick him through with a sword and not burn him, and it would be quick and a lot less painful. So the brother was thinking of getting stuck. So the older brother, they cut his tongue out. The younger brother was watching from the bars of his prison cell. And this is recorded. There's a whole book of all these martyrs' testimonies. It's beautiful to read. And he was watching, and he could see his hands. And you know, you know how when something's hurting, you're, you're kind of, you know, it was hurting. He was watching his hands, and then all of a sudden, he watched his hands, and the brother, he, he just, with his hands, said, you can endure this. It hurts, but his grace is sufficient. Now, he didn't say it, but the brother recorded in his journal that as he watched from the prison window, instead of his, his brother... You know, he said a calmness came over him, and with his hands he signaled, you can make it. How do you, how do you, I mean, I doubt if any of us are going to be burned. Well, I told Stitch at her way she's going, she's such a bold, you know, and she wants to go off in these closed countries. She might get it. But the rest of us probably won't, okay? Get martyred. But if you ever do, how do you make it? By starting today, being useful to God, by learning to listen to him every day, by saying, Lord, I want you to focus me on how great you are. I want you to control me. I want you to lead me. So here's what God offers. And we have uh, 17 minutes to get through it, and then we're done. God offers us to experience him continuously. Uh, do you remember the name of Jesus from Christmas story? And his name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That's God wants us to experience him continuously. He wants to be with us. I, I, I will close the class telling you the story of, of uh, Jesus is riding in the car and he just wants you to acknowledge him every day. He's kind of like your passenger. He's with you in life. He's with you when you walk from your dorm. He's with you everywhere. He says, I want you to experience me continuously. See, see verse 14? Who among us will dwell with a devouring fire? Who among us can dwell with this holy God? Well, the Bible defines it. And this is what I, I share, and it's in your notes. Six choices that preserve this healthy spiritual sight so that you can see God every day 
in his word and hear his voice. Number one, and these are just what it says. In verse 15, he who walks uprightly and speaks uprightly. He who walks righteously. Do you know it's so simple? Cultivate a lifestyle of practical purity. That means there should be nothing in your life that you keep around intentionally that defiles you. I was a youth pastor. Remember, I told you that. I've told you that over and over again. I had these students that came, and I would preach. By the way, I preached the same thing. I haven't preached the same thing. Ask Bonnie. I've said the same thing for 40 years. I would preach this to those high school kids. And all of a sudden, they'd look at me, and one of them says, "What? are you serious? I said, yeah. He said, well, let me ask you if this is one of those things. He says, look. And he took out his wallet, and he says, look what I have right here. And it was an old, ratty theater ticket, a stub. You know, when you go to a movie theater, they tear it in half, and you get one. He said, that's the theater ticket when I took my girlfriend to the theater, and we sat in the back row, and I touched her everywhere, and we went from there and had sexual intercourse. I said, what did you just say? He said, this is the ticket from the first time I had sex as a 14-year-old kid. I said, what on earth are you doing with that in your wallet? He said, every time I see it, I remember it. I said, did you know, and by the way, he struggled with pornography. Can you imagine such a thing? This kid, this high school kid. Why do you think he struggled with pornography? Because he reminded himself every day of the most vivid sin of his life. And he carried a trophy of it. And so at the end of this, you know, I went through this message. He said, if I practice a, a lifestyle of practical purity, what should I do? I said, well, you should probably burn that up. That's what Paul did. Remember in, in Ephesus? All the people that got saved brought all the things that were from their last life of demon worship, and they brought them, their magic and everything, and they put them in a pile and they burned them, and the Bible said it was worth 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a fortune. Cultivate a lifestyle of practical purity. Verse 15, walk righteously and speak uprightly. Uh, a lifestyle of holiness is what that is, but it doesn't stop there. Speak uprightly. After you, you decide to get rid of all the, anything that reminds you of past sins that, that leads you down, start saying, do you remember what James said? If you have your speech under control, your whole body is under control. God said that. That's James chapter 3. You remember it says if you put a, a bit in a horse's mouth, you can make the whole horse turn around. Did you, if you put a bit and bridle on a horse, you can have a horse turn. The horse will back up. It will do whatever. It, will, it does all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, I, we had Arabian horses, and I rode them, and they're amazing. You totally control them by their mouth. You know what God says? If you will give me your mouth. See what it says? He is, is one who, who desires to speak uprightly. Mouth under God's control. That's what God wants. The third thing he says in verse 15, who despises the gain of oppression. He won't take advantage of people. He won't get money at someone else's that harms someone else. They won't overcharge people. They won't underpay people. They won't cheat people. They won't keep if someone makes a mistake. They, you know what? They have a lifestyle of compassion. We covered that last hour. They despise that. They don't want oppression. They want nothing to do with that. Verse 15, it continues. Who gestures with hands, refusing bribes, they want honesty in, in the court system and, and everything else. Of course, this is all tied to them. But I love this one. Who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed. Did you know all the way through the Bible, God says he hates gratuitous bloodshed. What is gratuitous bloodshed? Being entertained by blood. How were the first century Romans entertained? What's the whole Colosseum? Gladiatorial fights. What is all that about? Did you know there's something inside people, especially men, that they love the gory 
fights, you know, boxing. If you box long enough, the person's face bleeds. It's a huge sport. Billions of dollars are spent watching fights with blood. In the Roman times, the, the animals would kill the animals, the gladiators would kill the animals, the animals would kill the gladiators, and the gladiators would kill each other. And when they ran out of that, do you know what they started doing? Taking criminals and throwing them in there. And instead of having them in jail, they just have them killed by animals and gladiators. And when they ran out of criminals, they criminalized Christianity. And that's how the Christians got in the arena. God says, I want you to stop being entertained, stop listening to and enjoying bloodshed. You say, that has nothing to do with me. It doesn't. What are 90% of all video games about? Oh, we say that's, you know, call of duty. It's my duty. Oh, killing people is your duty? It is the duty of those that are serving the government, Paul said in Romans 13, but it's not your duty to be entertained. But this one's even worse. Look, do you see what it says in verse 15, the end of it? And shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Hey, let me show you. Everybody wake up. I want to show you something. I took my kids to the outlets in New York. We were riding up to Word of Life, and my kids were all little, and Bonnie took some of them, and I had two of them. One, you know, we have eight, and some were older, and I just had these little ones. And we're walking along like this. I'll never forget this moment. I don't like to shop. Bonnie's inside in the outlets. I'm walking. I'm trying to walk to keep the kids busy. And I'm walking like this, holding their hands. And as we're walking around, I'm not even paying attention where we are. And I'm walking along, and I'm talking to the boys. And as we rounded the corner, I started down this way. And all of a sudden, I went like this. And I said, what are you doing? And my one son was holding my hand, and, and he had his hand over his eyes, and, and he was kind of bumping into stuff. And I said, will you stop that? I thought he was playing a game. And he went, guess where we were walking? We were in front of the, um, I don't know if it was Haynes, Bali, or Victoria's Secret outlet. But my son saw in the window, like a 15-foot-high girl in her underwear. And he said, I, am, I will never forget that moment. He had his hand over his eyes as a little seven-year-old boy. And he said, I will not, look at this, I will shut my eyes from seeing evil. Did you know that's almost a joke? If I told that on night television, everyone would laugh. Is a woman in her underwear evil? Are you kidding? New York Times just ran an article. Underwear is outerwear. That's, they said for the new season, the new thing is everybody is... Did you guys watch the Grammys? And the, I hope you didn't. The film festival, most of the starlets came in wearing less than a swimming suit. And they were photographed. I mean... It just the, the photographers of the world were going crazy on them because the New York Times said, underwear is outerwear. Why am I, why am I saying? Because God says this. God says that you, if you want to, if you want to learn how to listen and know me and grow in me, you have to say, I want to focus on God. I want you to control me. And God says, if I control you, you only look at things God calls pure. Not culture calls pure. Not your peers call pure. Not the majority calls pure. Things that God calls pure. We have to shut our eyes from being entertained by evil. What's the reward? What happens when, when we get that? Well, verse 17, your eyes will see the king. But there's more. And I call it the six indescribable joys of seeing God. And I want to go through these real quickly with you. Number one. He will dwell on high. The Lord says we'll have endless delights. Remember I told you the, the, uh, at, the theology of the attributes of God, his beauty was he has everything that's desirable. If you really believe that, then there are endless delights in knowing God. A place of defense will be a fortress of rock. We have true security. Uh, I think about the fact that in the Bible times, they didn't have glass in their windows. They didn't have nest cameras. They didn't have 
burglar alarms. They didn't have a, a pistol in their nightstand. We live in the most insecure time in history. They lived in, in the most truly insecure times. They, when David was out being God's king, anybody in the world could fire an arrow up in the air and it could fly over all their defenses. And unless you were constantly under your shield, you could get shot with an arrow back then because there was no protection. You know what David said? I'm not afraid. God is my security. He has determined my length of days. Bread will be given him. Our longings will be satisfied. That's the benefit that the Lord offers. His water will be sure. We'll have unending refreshment, like Psalm 23 says. Uh, he he uh, leads me beside the still waters. I'm refreshed. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. He's the greatest attraction of our life. You'll see the land that is very far off. How did Paul put that when he was talking to the Colossians? By the way, the Colossians had their own Colosseum and theater and all the gladiatorial stuff going on. And Paul said, you know what? You've come to Christ. Set your affection, Colossians 3.1, on things above. What is that? Seeing the land that is very far off. How are the saints of Hebrews 12 or 11 described? These all died in faith, not having obtained the promises, but having seen them afar off. They will see the land that is very far off. The heroes of the faith, the saints in Colossae and us today, need to have a heavenward gaze with God as our greatest attraction. How come we're not all like this? I'm glad you asked, because they asked Peter that. Look at, look at 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1. So 1 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, I'm almost there, 1, 8 and 9. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things is short-sighted, verse 9, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his old sins. Wow. Old sins. Beware of self-induced spiritual blindness. Forgetting who you are in Christ and going back to your old sins. That's the temptation for all of us. So, what these are, what I've just presented to you today from Isaiah 33 are choices that strengthen our daily focus on God. What we need to do is start godly habits. Now, how Paul put it is, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's every day choose to do that. What are some simple ways we can do that? Now you're here, and I had the privilege of having John and Eric and Isaac, who's sick today, Last night, we had our dorm time like you guys had with Bonnie. This is what I shared with them. Make a choice to read God's word before social media or any online activity every day. Here's how I illustrate it. Which do you do first? Check in, post, read, salivate over everybody's pretty pictures, or seek God. So... Make a choice that reflects Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Secondly, create a place where you can meditate and apply the truth of God in your own life. The most vital part of every day's devotional time is Jesus saying that we digest the food like we digest bread. You eat it. You don't eat it to spit it out. Some people just memorize verses to forget them. No, when you eat something, you want it to become a part of the very fabric of your cells within a few hours. That's what we do. But you have to find a place. That's why I go to coffee shops. They're playing their music. Everybody's busy doing something. And I can sit there where nobody knows me and meditate and write in my journal. Thirdly, pray or meditate on a verse instead of listening to music for 15 minutes a day. Because the Lord is waiting for us to spend time with him. So, someday we're going to stand before Jesus. 
And he's going to ask us, was your life lived for me or just on everything else? So how do we stay useful to the Lord? By taking a glimpse of him every day in his word. And that's my challenge to you.